Yeah, the word authentic is very interesting because it's somewhat imaginative. Like it's like in your own head.、Uh, everyone authentic memories and difference and. Uh, I definitely have to mention Bente Skjødgaard,、uh, who I was an intern with. She lives in Copenhagen, and also <clears throat> I remember before I was working with、uh, with glazes and ceramics、uh, professionally, and before I started my education, I was very inspired by also this woman, Danish woman, also based in Copenhagen, called Gitte Jongersen. She was doing these、um, square containers glazed with thick pastel-colored bubble glazes. So Gita Jongersen and Bente Skjødgaard. This is definitely somebody who inspired me. Two people that I saw、uh, when I was a kid. On the island of Bornholm, and I saw their work. And one is a guy. Actually, he's from Canada, but he has lived his、uh, life on Bornholm doing ceramics. And his name is Lenny Goldenberg. And he did these ceramic books where body parts would pop out. And I just thought they were very fun. They were fun to look at, and I was very fascinated、uh, by. This、uh, imagination and the things that you could do with clay, and also another guy called Heiko Nietzsche, who did um, um, like a leather bag or a T-shirt or a shirt that looked exactly like a shirt, but it was actually made of、uh, ceramics. And as a little girl, I was very fascinated by all these things that you could do with clay. So. Uh, they are some of my inspirational sources. I think that what set me off in this path of looking for、uh, materials that showed a different language in terms of glaze was that curiosity to see if it could become something else,、uh, and it all came from、um, this. Language variation that has been happening with me. So I am from Mexico. My father is Italian and my mother is Mexican. So I speak Italian and Spanish regularly. And it was when I came to the U.S. that I started speaking English constantly. And I understood the physical changes that happen within your body、uh, when you start adopting a new language. And I thought, what if you can show that through material? What if you can do that to material? What if glaze became A thing that you could cast and then carve, like a concrete is, or like plaster. And then I realized that when you do that to glaze, it also becomes something like a stone, and that you could polish it like a stone, and it could become a sort of marble. And I started、uh, understanding these connections not only in the way that I was turning material, but in the forms that I was using, the formal、um, elements that I was using in my work. That、uh, connected back to to my background as a Mexican and as an Italian. So that's really what set me off in this path of of looking for a different language for glaze and、um, yes, and explore that materiality more. I think I think it depends also where you are. I. Um, I come from Mexico. I come from Latin America, and I see all of these women making really great groundbreaking art in Latin America. And here, you don't really hear about it because, I mean, the U.S. is its own thing. But I think about, for example, one that maybe people know, Ana Mendieta, and how breaking her work was, how she used her body to communicate, how she really broke a lot of the rules. And she's not. She's starting to be more talked about, but not really. And I think about the Mexican artist Maris Bustamante, and how she really broke a lot of the rules of art that were in Mexico. Mexico sometimes is still not sometimes. I think it's still a very male-centered country, 
And I really think that a lot of female artists get overlooked just because of that reason. And when I was thinking about this question, I was also thinking about all of the, um, we call them artesanas and artesanos in Mexico, all of these people that make what is considered here folk art and how a lot of their forms, a lot of their work is referenced here in the US. I see it a lot. I see, I know where you took that from. And please just credit these people because that's their livelihood, that's their work, and they don't really get recognized for for that, for something that they have dedicated their lives to. The aesthetic inspiration for my glazing came from a confluence of formative experiences. I'm from Philadelphia, which has been hugely influential to my aesthetic. It's a city that is just layered in narrative. There's so much graffiti and murals built into the city and it's an old city. So it's not just that the graffiti has been painted over and repainted, that the buildings themselves have lived very long lives. And so their facades are crumbling. And so the buildings are alive and brick is clay. And so my relationship to this material has been really informed by living around this like alive landscape of human creation. And I also got to travel a lot as a child because of my father's job. So I spent a lot of time as a very young child in Thailand and Brazil and Israel. And those experiences of their architecture of the fabrics, I think a lot about fabric of watching silk get made and hammered bowls and painted fans and, you know, thinking about golden Buddhas. And I think about my use of luster right now. And a lot of it comes from that, those really formative experiences as well as um, my uh, involvement in punk, glam, and metal. As growing up in the 80s and 90s, I feel lucky to have grown up in the wonderful 80s and 90s. And those genres, just like the passion and sincerity, this idea that, you know, I think about metal music and how angry and dark it is, but then I think about this man who spent hours doing his makeup you know, and doing his hair. And so those two things coexisting. And so in my glazes, again, you know, I'm talking about metal music, but in my glazing, I want it to be like gross and dirty and alive and beautiful all at once. And so like a lot of that, like I'm using spikes and thinking about studded jackets and leather belts and things like that. And then I also um, went to school at University of Michigan. And so I got to study under Sadashi and Azuka which was very fortunate. We landed at University of Michigan at the same time. So in 1996, and his approach to teaching was, I can tell you the rules of ceramics, but then you're gonna try and break them. So I would rather you figure them out for yourself. And that was huge for me. I went to school for creative writing and painting. So inspired by abstract expressionist painters like Chaim Soutin and Hunderwasser and Anselm Kiefer, but then once I got there and Sadashi kind of opened this door, the materiality of clay and glaze allowed me to do things that paint just couldn't. So it got me, I was still painting for a long time, but I was using just broader materials and Sadashi's opening of those doors um, really allowed me to do that in a way that felt very natural and exciting for me. Um, again, coming from this punk background where like, I don't listen to rules, I want to push back. So kind of inventing my own path for that. Um, also at Michigan, we first day of ceramics one, you made your own clay, you made 500 pounds of clay. I didn't know that you can buy pre-bagged clay. I tell my students this all the time. Like I didn't know that existed till I was working in clay for like three years. And again, I think that's really, really important because to me, clay was never this commercial product. I never had to get away from a bag of clay and a container of glaze. I didn't have that. So it was always to me, just materials that I was pulling from very fluidly. One of my students this week brought to class an article from the Studio Potter, uh, Robin Hopper's article, Weird and Unusual Glaze Materials. And that really resonated with me because that's how I approached ceramics from the start is finding kitty litter and laundry detergent and adding all those things to see what magic could happen in the kiln. And so that really like directed my entire relationship to the material was seeing what could happen. And so. I look at people who are doing this extreme glazing and Matthew Katz and, you know, here in San Diego, we have Richard Burkett who are just chemists or geniuses and are doing this amazing thing. And I am so 
Um, I have so much admiration for that. And I'm in it for the magic. Like I am not that chemist. I am the person who's like, I'm going to see what happens when I throw all these things. And I have, have enough experience, I can make calculated risks. But if it's not surprising to me, it's not as interesting. So I'm in it to like throw everything at the table and see what crazy thing I can have happen in the kiln. Um, that's what gets exciting for me when I encountered Clayton Bailey's work. Um, he was really influential as well in terms of just not living within what we're supposed to do with the materials, this kind of broadening of what they mean. And then I also really appreciated um, Lauren's article and talking about the context of extreme glazing as well, particularly with my work, I'm sculpting these fluid forms and then having this lava glaze or and sometimes I'm actually growing crystals onto my forms. And it's very exciting to me that I have these really articulated drip formations that look alive and that look fluid, but they're very static and very controlled. And then I have this rock that we conceptually think of as very static, but it's actually what's alive. It's actually what's in the kiln is evolving and changing and fluid. And so I love, again, the dissonance between you know, your perception of what's alive and what's not, or what's static and what's moving. And so the fact that glaze can do all of that is so exciting to me. So there's still like a big painter inside me. Um, you know, I think of Roxy Payne and some of the work he was doing with the um, sculpture make making machines where he was um, using the paint to create those like blobjects. He was making blobjects out of paint. Um, all of those influencers are really prominent for me, but I, at the end of the day, I want to be a magician. That's kind of like my goal in the studio. And so that's where a lot of, a lot of the drive comes from. And that's what keeps it exciting for me. I think a couple of things that come to mind for me, a passion for low relief that I was just plain born with. Another one is um, a synesthesia, which makes me very attracted to staring hard into saturated color, which lead glazes have, and lead glazes also happen to have this crystal clear, um, like watery, puddly depth to them. And I think the idea of movement in glazes, particularly am attracted to some historic uh, Mexican pottery that flows against gravity. And I'm very attracted to any kind of historic glaze that flows against gravity. So Oaxacan dripware is one. My new favorite is Byzantine splashware. Um, Tang Dynasty glazes, also great. I grew up with just a, a whole cloud of Mexican pottery in my midst that uh, my parents collected. Because when you grow up in San Antonio, the border is only two hours, and that's the best and quickest way to get out of Texas. And then you wound up getting buying things that were at the time called kitsch. They were not kitsch, they were simply Mexican ephemera. And we grew up with all this stuff, and it's really fun to stare into those rich, deep green colors of amber and green. And so I have a particular affinity for those. So I think. Um, when I got to college, I was not, uh, as when I, once I discovered ceramics, um, I also was told that stoneware was the only legitimate type of uh, clay to use. You couldn't turn in earthenware for a grade. However, I will say I took a bunch of workshops after college in the early eighties. And one of them was from Clary Ilian. I would always drag my pottery in to poor Warren McKenzie or Michael Simon or whoever, Clary Ilian. I drag my pots in and say, please give me a critique. Tell me what you think. And she looked at me quizzically and said, your pots are really strange with your glaze. And of course they were stoneware. And she goes, what kind of pots do you like? And I named five kinds of pottery. And she goes, you know what? Those are all earthenware. I didn't know that was earthenware. Like, no. Anyway. And so she goes, I think you ought to look at that. I took her seriously. And I decided not to be a real potter if pottery could only be stoneware and to go ahead and look at earthenware. And also in 1985, the first, um, 
Mayolica Glaze was published in Ceramics Monthly around around 1985. And we all, all of us San Antonio Potters kind of looked at each other and said, can we get away with trying this? And we did. So that was where I got my start on the materiality. Uh, I want to talk for a second about uh, the name, uh, this glaze that I call, I call it cowbell because it's copper colored like a cowbell. And because I like to joke to myself that I need more cowbell sometimes. So it's, it's original name was copper sparkle. So if you're looking for an adventuring crystal and glaze out there in the world, those are the two names it would fall under. That glaze, I was testing amber glazes uh, to see if I could get one to crackle less. And so I just started adding things that I thought would help. And I'm not that good of a chemist, but I do like trying stuff. And so I added some lithium in and I added some vanadium and I added some different things. Super saturated and amber glaze and just came up with this um, crystalline glaze. And I didn't know what it was. I had not seen this before. So Lauren, so it's been passed out to lots of people and Lauren uses it so well on her work. And she uses it as a contrast. When I first got it, like I didn't know what to do with it. And I had a very busy piece and I painted the whole thing with it. And it was just like, oh, like even for me, more is more um, with like with depth and color and dripping and dripping the opposite way and all this. But that glitter glaze was like, it deflected all of the attention away from the form in all directions all the time. So what I've come to um, use it as for me, I love how Lauren uses it sometimes like as just like a focal point and then you can travel around her pot and with all using all the other lines and colors. For me, I use it as a contrast, that crystalline contrast, which brings your eye right to the surface and then you it plunges into the depths. Uh, the first artist that come in my is Tashiku Takeyasu, uh, Japanese Americans potter who did like um, monumental pots, and I think that was one of the work that really, really introduced me to the interest in ceramics. To be honest, uh, I was very drawn into her glazing surface, the expressiveness onto the work itself. But then there's also a lot of sensibility where I don't see that in a lot of um, other potter that is among that period of times where they just more like a masculinities with actions. But uh, something with uh, Tagies who works is that like there's some some part of sensibility that I don't see it with a lot of other uh, male potter, if I would say it in that way. Uh, so that was something that I really draw into that sense of presence, but then there's also there's that actions and emotion were being very suppressed in the same times are so present and uh, and very down to earth. And I, I absolutely love her works. <laughs> wow, this is amazing. Of course, there's many more of the artists that I was, um, you know, getting, when we talk about the efficacities of the glaze itself, um, of course, Lauren works was one of it as well. When I saw her work in 2014, uh, maybe 2013 in Houston, I was like, wow, who is that artist? So beautiful. All the work is so painterly, like it's so expressive. And I want to be like that. And um, with other works that uh, was influenced me is actually, I do reference a lot with like um, Chinese watercolor painting. Um, not just in the realm of the ceramics field, but I really look up to this one artist. She is a um, contemporary Chinese woman artist. Uh, her name is Pen Wei. And uh, she did a lot of like watercolor paintings where, again, that kind of sensibility that uh, has a touch of emotions into her work. It's very simple and in watercolor, Chinese watercolor painting, uh, we got a lot of like glaze overs with, you know, inks and stuff. And that kind of like fading in and out foreground and background uh, becomes something that I'm very interested in, in the style of watercolor. Despite the fact it's like very different than anything that I do, but I think it is totally okay <laughs> to always have reference that not necessarily reflect uh, completely on my work, but more conceptually, yeah. Uh, the first person that uh, popped up in my mind, Lina Major. Um, so she is a Bahamas 
Americans, and she's doing a lot of work that is related to you know、uh, concept of homes and a lot of installation arts that she put it in, and and I think that like、uh, her work. Uh, she liked to experiment with glaze, and as we spend times at grad school, that's just things that, like you know, things that we'll be discuss about. Like, oh, what what should we do with glaze? And and of course,、uh, we all have a mentor from、um, Samong Lee、uh, as one of our mentor during and our grad school at、uh, RISD, and so that's one of the things that. Have、uh, been happens, and、uh, a second person that I'm going to mention is also my peers in the grad school, So Yu Noah. So she's a South Asian、uh, artist from Myanmar, and、um, as you guys might all know, that Myanmar have going through some、uh, very political. I don't even know what's the word to say, but things that are happening in Myanmar are extremely severe, and I think. A lot of people needs to pay attention、um, in what happens in Myanmar, and she is currently in Myanmar right now and experiencing a lot of those、um, uh, brutality that's happening through the coups, and as well as、um, I talk to her daily. So、uh, we've been working on a project together. So that's that's kind of information I've been absorbing every days and. Um, she's been really heavily promoting South Asia artists,、um, so I think that she's another person that we should all look up to her.、Uh, she's been doing a lot of great stuff to bringing in bridging our culture. Part of the influence that got me through interest in all this,、uh, the texture of glaze, and it was、uh, one of this is Catherine Taylor. And、uh, she was, <laughs> she was actually one of the artists that I、uh, remember. I have a big scrapbook that、uh, was like 500 pages thick, and I cut out her pic- pictures and stick it on my books. And remember, I was like circling out, love this glaze texture, amazing. And、uh, so, so I didn't know that like you know she did a lot of. You, Sculpture that is so related with the dripping glaze texture, and it was surprising me that like you know why she isn't in the list. Like I remember she did this way early too. Other artists I also look up to, not just in the field of ceramics, but also in the printmaking world.、Uh, particularly, this one artist, her name is、uh, Tomashi Jackson. And she was one of the Whitney Biennial in 2019, and、uh, she did a lot of overlaying of、um, kind of a sculpturally painting, and with pre-making、um, a collage of storytellings related with histories and politicals. Um, point of views that into the work without really telling,、uh, using the word itself. He, she used imagery and the way that how she overlaying texture as well as、um, colors. It's really like quite inspiring me to think about layers in terms of that. And so yeah, I think that's it. <laughs>